Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to day two of the British Conference of Undergraduate Research. It's great to see you all. Um, let's just have a show of hands from the people who've just arrived today. <laughs> Put your hand up who've just arrived today. Hooray, thank you for coming. Um, welcome to LSE and welcome to the BCUR. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that I'm not going to do a big welcoming speech because that happened yesterday and it wasn't me. But for those of you who don't know me, my name's Claire Gordon. I'm director of the Eden Centre for Education Enhancement and it's the fantastic people in my team who've made this conference possible um, yesterday and today. I do have some sort of, I guess, you know, business updates I want to give you before I introduce Dr. Gillian Terry and her. She's going to do a fantastic keynote address which couldn't be on a more appropriate topic for this wonderful multidisciplinary conference uh, on Beyond Boundaries, the Power of Becoming Interdisciplinary. And I just wanted to reiterate one thing I said yesterday, which is it's, this is a very unusual conference for LSE, not only to bring nearly 400 students from across the UK and also internationally onto our campus, but I'm sure most of you know this, but we're a social science institution. So we don't have arts and humanities departments, and we don't have very many science departments, and we certainly don't have medicine. So it's a great privilege and pleasure to welcome you all here for the second day, or for those of you who are here for the first day. So I want to let you know a couple of things, first of all. Um, we've made some lovely, shiny certificates for you all. So if you go up, um, and pick up your certificates in the same office, um, one on the first floor of this building, room 17, you can pick up your certificates um, and pin them on your wall and remember the happy times you spent during BCUR 2024. There are poster exhibitions in the lower ground floor of this building and in room up on the first floor, room 110, I believe. 117. 117, no, that's our office. 118 um, of the first uh, of, of this building. So please go and have a look at the posters. Um, I've been so impressed having conversations with people about their work. Um, I think posters are a fantastic form of communicating research. So do go and in between the kind of oral sessions where the presenta panel presentations, go and talk to people about their research. And I dare you to go and talk to somebody whose poster looks like something you would, would never understand in a million years and see if they can explain it to you. We have parallel sessions, another set of parallel sessions after the keynote, and then there'll be some lunch um, down here in the lower ground floor. The sessions are in the three smaller lecture theatres um, on the lower ground floor and on the first and second floor of this building. The only other thing I wanted to say is that as, as was the case yesterday, we've organized a series of kind of exciting workshops to support your skills development um, as researchers. Um, we've got two taking place in the LSE library. One is called Using Archives for Research and the other is going to take you to a current exhibition on in the library, which is about solidarity and nuclear defense in the Cold War. And I have, I don't know if they were today or yesterday, but there are a couple of posters ar around um, sec security and, and nuclear weapons uh, and, and so on. So that, that if you want to go to the library this afternoon at 4.20, David is going to meet people in the ground floor. David, where are you going to meet them? Ground floor by the Red Globe at 4.15, and he will take you over to the library. And then we have two um, other skills development sessions here. One is being delivered by our wonderful colleagues from Warwick University, Getting Your Research Ready for Reinvention, which is an undergraduate student journal published by the University of Warwick, in case you're thinking of further routes for dissemination of your research. And also um, another session focused on thinking about dissemination, making research accessible and understandable for wider audiences. So I think both the, all those different opportunities this afternoon will be great. And then at the end of the day, we'll have the closing ceremony and I'll be handing over the Olympic torch, the BCUR torch, to the University of Newcastle who'll be hosting this conference next year. So I think that's all the sort of housekeeping stuff, which means I can turn to the really exciting stuff, which is to introduce my long-term colleague, who, who, Dr. Gillian Terry, and I, I, we couldn't have a better title for a keynote for the BCUR. Um, Gillian Terry is an associate professor at LSE, and she's co-director 
of LSE 100, which is an interdisciplinary course which all undergraduate students in their first year of study take at LSE, um, cross, seeking ways to cross disciplinary boundaries and seeing the affordances of, of crossing disciplinary boundaries. Gillian trained as an international relations scholar. Her research foregrounds ethical perspectives on violence and focuses on the role of new technologies in war and surveillance. And alongside that, she works on the scholarship of teaching and learning with research interests in inter interdisciplinarity, which she's going to be talking about today, and inclusive pedagogies, which I know many of you are interested in as well. And Gillian also is by nature a member of our BCUR community because she has been a long-term enthusiastic advocate for student research. During her time at a as a student at Memorial University in Canada, she founded the institution's first student-run academic journal, which is called Mapping Politics. And in 2021, she helped to establish LSE's own interdisciplinary student research conference, Knowledge Beyond Boundaries, which gives opportunities to students at all levels, undergraduate levels, taught masters, and, and postgraduate researchers working towards PhDs to present their work in an interdisciplinary environment. So please put your hands together and give a great round of applause for Gillian. Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can hear me OK. Uh, if you can't hear me in the back, wave, and I'll adjust. But hopefully everything uh, is working. Thank you so much to Claire uh, for the introduction. And thank you to the whole BCUR organizing committee here at LSE, and the hard work of David and Hong Lee, and for the invitation to come along today and deliver this keynote. Um, I'm really, really delighted to be here. And congratulations to all of you for being accepted to this conference, for having the chance to come along to LSE and showcase your research. So as Claire said, today I'm going to talk to you about this idea of moving beyond disciplinary boundaries and the power of becoming interdisciplinary. Um, this comes out of the work that I've been doing here at the LSE for quite a while, but also from my sort of journey through academia to getting to where I am today. So I'm going to hopefully tell you a little bit about that tell you a little bit about what it means to do interdisciplinary work, why we might value interdisciplinary perspectives and approaches, and then think about four different stages for you to become interdisciplinary in what you are doing and how to take that forward in your own research, in your own study. So my path to interdisciplinarity is kind of a messy one, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So I started in political science and I I did, back in Canada in my hometown, I went to Memorial University, and I studied political science and English language and literature. And I knew sort of right away that I was interested in communication. So how do people communicate in political spheres, right? So I wanted to bring together ideas from English, ideas from communication studies, and ideas from political science. I ended up writing a dissertation about how we communicate globalization and sort of masculinity within that, which um, I think was my first foray into interdisciplinarity. I had a chance at the, in the final year of my undergraduate degree to actually participate in a conference very similar to this one. Uh, it was called the Aldrich, Aldrich Conference, and it was an interdisciplinary space or multidisciplinary space for students to come together and share research. And to me, that opened my eyes, that I could move beyond the boundaries of my degree program, of the specific subject that I had come to university to study, and actually think about how do we bring together, how do we synthesize ideas from across those different perspectives in order to try to make change, right? In order to try to make the world a bit of a better place, to um, address some of the big challenges or the big problems that we see in the world. And I think that was the first opportunity that I really had to say, actually, it's maybe not enough to just take one disciplinary perspective on a problem or an issue. So then I did some postgraduate study. I did my master's at Carleton University in Ottawa in Canada. Um, and there, I really moved into that space of international relations. But I brought in more of feminist and gender studies. So I was thinking about feminist perspectives on war and, and violence. Um, and fundamentally, that's what got me here to the LSE. So I ended up doing a PhD in international relations here at the LSE that focused on feminist ethics of war. So it was. IR theory, feminist theory. I brought in a lot of ethics, so coming out of philosophy. And that was quite an interdisciplinary project. I've, I'm not afraid to say now that that project was, I think, not necessarily fully accepted in my department mm -hmm. at the time, right? I had a department that, if any, any students from the IR department are here, 
um, at the time that I was here doing my PhD, the IR department at LSE was very traditional, right? So we were very much a uh, sort of monodisciplinary department. And there wasn't a whole lot of appetite for more interdisciplinary work. So that was a struggle for me at the level of doing a PhD, trying to find that space, carving out what I thought was my niche in terms of what I was doing, what I was looking at, what I was researching. And now I work at LSE 100. And as Claire said, we are a flagship interdisciplinary course. We're a sector leading course that really tries to get students to think beyond the boundaries of their subjects and their degrees. And so I've moved into the space of thinking about education and pedagogy. So it's a sort of a messy journey, but you can maybe start to see why I'm now so interested in this idea of becoming interdisciplinary. So before we go any further, I thought I would give us a definition from the literature. This definition comes from Klein and Newell. It's one that I particularly like. It's not, certainly not the only one, right? There's contested definitions of interdisciplinarity. If you have read up on any of the scholarship in this area, you'll know this. But Klein and Newell focus on this idea of interdisciplinarity as a process, which I like, because it kind of suggests that becoming interdisciplinary is a continuum, right? There's no end point. There's no, OK, we've done it now. We can walk away. It's a process. And so Klein and Newell talk about interdisciplinarity as the process of answering a question, solving a problem, or addressing a topic that's too broad or complex to be dealt with adequately by a single discipline or profession. It draws on different disciplinary perspectives and integrates their insight. Remember this idea of integration, because we'll come back to this later. So this is the definition that I like to present in you know, areas like this, because I think it gives us a good grounding, right, of what we mean when we talk about interdisciplinarity. It's quite a buzzword. It's something we see everywhere. We, talk, we see it talked about in research. We see it talked about in university promotional materials, right? If you've ever applied, when you're applying to universities, you're probably seeing this word interdisciplinary a lot. But what does it actually mean? And I think Klein and Newell do a good job of grounding our ideas of interdisciplinarity in this idea of a process. So where are you now? in your sort of journey of becoming interdisciplinary. So if we think about monodisciplinarity, right, sort of single independent disciplines, this might be your degree program right now. You might feel like you're in a very sort of straightforward single discipline degree. That, that's what you're studying. You might be already in a multidisciplinary or even an interdisciplinary degree program. LSE has tons of joint programs, so students doing sort of two subjects. So they're doing sort of multidisciplinary work at the undergraduate level. Programs like PPE, if we think about politics, philosophy, and economics coming together, I think when done well, those programs can get to that idea of interdisciplinarity. So you might be here in this, this monodisciplinary space, right? This idea of becoming an expert in a field, really deep diving into one subject area. You might be thinking about this space of multidisciplinarity. So this conference, I think, is a great example of what multidisciplinarity looks like, right? Because you get different disciplinary perspectives in a room together. Now, what happens when those perspectives come together is sort of up to you all, right? Because you could all be talking to each other sort of at cross purposes, sort of ships passing in the night, maybe not understanding each other, not really getting to the crux of what the challenges and the ideas you're trying to present are. Or you could be moving into a more interdisciplinary space where you're synthesizing ideas together, you're integrating them together, and maybe those ideas or insights become greater than the sum of their parts, right? And that's, I think, the really critical move between multi and interdisciplinarity. is this idea of not just being in a room, having our different disciplinary hats on at any one time, and maybe talking to each other about that, but then thinking about the, the hardest part, which is bringing those perspectives together and coming up with something new as a result. New holistic understandings of the world, of some social phenomena, whatever it is that we're interested in studying. And you'll notice here that I've got sort of double-ended arrows in between these different spheres, right? And that's because it's not a linear journey. We shouldn't be thinking about we move from monodisciplinary to multidisciplinary to interdisciplinary in that way. Actually, we are all moving back and forth between these different spheres all the time. And if you're doing interdisciplinarity well, right, you should also be thinking about, well, how do I learn more about different fields? How do I deep dive into other fields that I might be interested in? 
or that might be relevant for my research. And so the goal isn't to sort of move, you know, from monodisciplinarity being the worst to interdisciplinarity being the best. And not at all. In fact, it is this process. It's this continuum, this back and forth through our scholarly journeys of thinking about things in an interdisciplinary way, synthesizing those insights, but then coming back to our disciplines, learning more about our disciplines, deep diving into the theories and methods and frameworks of our disciplines that we think are really valuable. So this is another graphic that I really like that maybe does a better job of explaining what I've just said, but multidisciplinarity is really about these different disciplines in interaction with each other, but still very much disciplines, right? We can see them very clearly. In an interdisciplinary space here in the middle, we see those overlaps. And those areas of overlap are the most interesting areas, in my opinion. Those are the areas where we start to find common ground between our disciplinary perspectives. And when we're able to actually take what's useful for us from those different disciplines and bring it together to generate something new. Even though in an interdisciplinary space, disciplines are still identifiable, right? We can still know where theories are coming from, methods are coming from, frameworks are coming from. Transdisciplinarity, which I'm not really going to spend much time on today, but happy to talk about in questions, is about moving beyond the idea of academic disciplines at all. Right? It's, and it's relatively controversial because of that, because I think as academics and as researchers, sometimes we're very cautious, maybe a bit hesitant, to give up our disciplinary identities. Right? But transdisciplinarity, you can see in this final graphic, the idea of disciplines becomes almost indistinguishable from each other, right? They become so blurred that we can't necessarily tell where one discipline starts and another ends. So this is the sort of framework that we're operating within. And I think, from my perspective, interdisciplinarity is a really interesting space for you all to explore as student researchers. And so we're going to talk about why. So it equips you with knowledge and skills to tackle complex challenges, right? So thinking about what Klein and Newell were saying, those problems that cannot adequately be understood by a single discipline, complex challenges need an interdisciplinary perspective. <clears throat> it develops your skills in critical thinking because you start to understand when you do interdisciplinary work, not just what your discipline's value is, right? What the benefits of your discipline are, but also what are its limitations? What are the blind spots of your discipline? What are the gaps where your discipline, your subject, doesn't really consider or interrogate or investigate adequately? And you actually can start to think, where can we start to plug those gaps? What other perspectives might we bring in to start to understand this problem or this, this phenomenon more fully, more holistically? It also helps you to learn by connecting ideas and concepts from different disciplines, right? And this deepens your understanding of your own discipline. It helps you actually to become more of an expert in your field to do interdisciplinary work. Because all of a sudden, part of your job is to explain ideas from your discipline to other people who aren't in that same community, right? And you're all doing that at this conference. You're trying to present your work in a way that's accessible to people who aren't in your field, don't have the same methodological, theoretical backgrounds to you, right? And this is a really, really key skill that I think is valuable, not just in research, but in life. And then finally, and I think really importantly, interdisciplinarity prepares you to collaborate with others and to work effectively as part of a diverse team. <clears throat> because when we go out into the working world, the vast majority of us, day to day, don't work with other people who've studied the exact same thing as us, right? We work in these diverse teams, and we need to be able to talk to those people, to collaborate with those people effectively, and to draw on our relative strengths, right? Our different kinds of expertise. So it's why so much interdisciplinary work is collaborative work. So I don't know if you've ever heard the parable of the blind men and the elephant, but I think there are lessons from this parable for interdisciplinarity, right? Because we think about, if you don't know the, the parable, basically it goes, there are a bunch of blind men all feeling different parts of an elephant trying to figure out what it is. And the man at the front who's touching the elephant's tusk says, well, it's a spear. And then someone touching the elephant's legs say, it's a tree, it's a fan, it's a wall, 
it's a rope. None of the men have ad correctly identified what it is, right? None of them know that it's an elephant. But they are all using their own subjective experience and perspective to try to guess what's happening here. They don't even know that there are other subjective experiences around the elephant that are different to them. So the value of taking a new perspective, of valuing what other people's perspectives have to say, is a core part of what interdisciplinarity tries to do. And so I actually think that this parable is a really useful one for explaining the value of interdisciplinarity. Right? The moral of this story is that we need to see other people's perspectives in order to understand the world around us. And I think that is true of interdisciplinary work. Part of what we do as interdisciplinary scholars is to think about what other perspectives have to say, to value those approaches and perspectives, and to bring them in to what we're trying to do. We know that the world is full of contested concepts, contested understandings. So this is a photograph from, uh, from Rio, and it shows the uh, favelas, on one side, on the left side of the image, and on the right side of the image, we see these sort of high rises you know, with pools and tennis courts and that kind of thing. Ideas about living in a city, right, about what it means to live in a big city, are going to be extremely different on either side of this image. Ideas about equality, about fairness, about justice, are going to be understood wildly differently by the people residing on either side of this image. But both sets of understandings are really necessary, for example, if you're an urban studies scholar, in order to make change in Rio, in order to make Rio a better city to live in for all of its residents. And so interdisciplinarity helps us to grapple with this idea of contestation in how we understand the world, the kinds of concepts that we see being raised across the academy, in the world around us, right, in policy work, all benefit from us taking an interdisciplinary approach. This is an, another uh, cartoon that I really like. We see one uh, man here on a desert island, he's yelling boat, looking for that uh, boat to save him. The other man in the boat saying land, right? It's been adrift, he wants land. The importance of perspective taking, what it means that each of these individuals have different but interdependent needs for each other. The biggest problems we face today, the most complex challenges we see, are interdependent, right? We see that it's important for us to understand those different perspectives in order to make any effort to try to solve those problems. So while we might see problems very differently, interdisciplinarity gives us a bit of common ground. It allows us to make space for contributions from different perspectives and approaches in order to try to address or solve or make positive change towards those problems. So this importance of taking different perspectives and the valuing of perspectives, I think for me, keeps coming up as one of the core tenets of interdisciplinarity. Nevertheless, we feel the pull of disciplines, right? Everywhere, everywhere around us, disciplines are still really important, right? Universities are organized in departments, right? Disciplines, physical spaces dedicated to single disciplines. Academic journals, by and large, dedicated to single disciplines, right? If you want to publish in international relations and you want that publication to be, you know, well-received, renowned, you know, have a high impact factor, you need to publish in a top disciplinary journal. So those, that pull of single disciplines and monodisciplinarity is still very strong. I like this cartoon, which sort of exemplifies this, right? It's this idea of what are we missing out on? So this scientist says, I'm on the verge of a major breakthrough, but I'm also at that point where chemistry leaves off and physics begins, so I'll just have to drop the whole thing, right? Because I'm a chemist, I'm not a physicist. And so drawing that hard line in the sand and saying, well, I can't study that because I'm not an expert in that field. Actually, what, are, what do we end up missing out on in terms of the developments of science, of the humanities, of different social phenomena that we might want to know more about? And alongside that pull of disciplines, we feel this push of what we call wicked problems. 
So some of you may be familiar with wicked problems as a framework. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them. But wicked problems basically tell us that the kinds of challenges and problems that we face in the world today cannot be solved by a single discipline. Right? Disciplines themselves are no longer enough to address these challenges because of how complex they are, because of how interconnected and interdependent they are, and because of how unpredictable they are in how they move and shift over time. So we have on one side this pull of disciplines, but on the other side, a whole set of challenges and problems that actually are resistant to disciplinary analysis, right? Or at least they'll, they can be analyzed by disciplines, but not potentially solved by them. So wicked problems uh, is a framework. I mean, I do encourage you to go read more about this. It comes from Riddle and Weber, management theorists in the 1970s. Uh, it's since been widely applied, right? So we see with the wicked problems framework being used in industry and in policy spaces. We see it in academia. And we're not talking about wicked here in a sort of moral sense, right? We're not, we're not talking about that kind of wickedness. The kind of wickedness we're talking about when we talk about wicked problems are these kinds of characteristics. So problems are really unique and distinctive. Problems are really hard to define. They're multi-causal, multi-scalar, interconnected. They have different stakeholders and conflicting agendas. There's sort of these 10 characteristics that we often talk about in the literature as characterizing what wicked problems are. Where I want to draw your attention is here. So these are problems that straddle organizational and disciplinary boundaries. Problems where we know that the nature of the problem itself and the way we might address or solve that problem requires at least a multidisciplinary perspective and ideally an interdisciplinary one. So examples of wicked problems, you can probably think of some. Homelessness, a really sort of commonly talked about wicked problem. Right? The causes and effects of homelessness are so interconnected and multiscalar um, and have so many different stakeholders with different needs and interests. Food insecurity, classic example of a wicked problem. Climate change, of course, right? Maybe the wicked problem of our time. Pandemics, a, a very wicked problem, right? One that we saw in action. Uh, many, many scholars have come that sort of now in our the post pandemic period to say what we needed at the time and what we should strive for for future pandemics is an interdisciplinary approach. Right for health experts and policy experts and economists to actually talk to each other and engage with each other meaningfully as opposed to sitting in silos and you know working on their particular solutions. So lots of wicked problems out there, some of which you're probably thinking about and studying, but something that I think is worth bearing in mind when you're talking about future research. So wicked problems, therefore, my argument is that wicked problems call for wicked or interdisciplinary problem solving. The kinds of approaches we take to address these problems requires us to engage with different disciplinary perspectives. So you can do this by reflecting on your discipline too, right? So thinking back, and this is something that you can think about after today, you can make notes about, you can come back to, what methods, theories, frameworks does your discipline offer for tackling wicked problems? What are the limitations of your discipline? What connections or tensions exist with other disciplines? Start to ask yourself those questions about the subject you're studying or the subjects you're studying, and that will start to, I think, highlight to you areas where that may be really fruitful for interdisciplinary work. But I'm going to give you four stages before we end up with some time for questions, hopefully, at the end. Four stages, four steps for becoming interdisciplinary. Stage one, disciplinary grounding. Right? We can't really get anywhere in terms of doing interdisciplinary work if we don't have that disciplinary grounding. So what does that mean? Well, it means basic knowledge and understanding of a discipline, how knowledge is constructed, validated, communicated. So a lot of that sort of epistemological stuff of a discipline. What phenomena are studied by the discipline? What's the subject or object of inquiry? And key assumptions of those disciplines, right? So thinking about 
stage one, what it means to become interdisciplinary, you need to have this disciplinary grounding. But I think crucially, and I think people make this mistake quite often, people think, well, I can't do interdisciplinarity until I have a PhD in my field, because I need to be a real expert in my field in order to do interdisciplinary work. And I actually think that could not be farther from the truth. I think the best time to do interdisciplinary work and to start engaging with questions of interdisciplinarity is in an undergraduate degree. Because you have space to think a little bit more widely, right? To bring in ideas and perspectives from maybe outside options or outside modules that you've done, ideas that you hear about at conferences like this. And in fact, I would argue that by doing interdisciplinary work at the undergraduate level, you're doing it at a time when you don't yet have those really hardened disciplinary boundaries, right? The further you go in a field, the more deeply you dive into that field, the more you engage with academic journals, the more you go to conferences only with people in your field, you sort of talk at each other because you all come from the same perspective, right? I'm caricaturing, caricature, caricature here a little bit, but you know what I'm trying to get at. The more you do that, the more hardened your ideas of a disciplinary identity are going to be, right? And so actually, engaging with interdisciplinarity early on, at this stage, I think is the perfect time to be thinking about these questions. So when I say disciplinary grounding, you know here, I, did not, I don't say anywhere here, become an expert, right? You don't need to be an expert in a discipline in order to do interdisciplinary work. Stage two perspective taking. So once you've got that disciplinary grounding and you feel comfortable working in a discipline or a couple of disciplines, thinking about analyzing the problem differently, right? So how would a discipline analyze a problem? Okay, well, what's another way to do that? Right, step back and think of alternatives. Having an open mind and to value different ideas is a core part of this, right? So don't shut down ideas that might feel very different to those that you're familiar with in your, in your field and in your discipline. This is something I tell my first year students all the time, right? Just because someone has a different idea of what uh, the market is and what markets are for, doesn't mean that those ideas are wrong or incorrect or invalid or not valuable to us, right? It means actually that we need to start thinking about what it means to take different perspectives. And this, I think a really big part of this is reflecting on our own cognitive biases and assumptions, which we have, right? Whether or not they're conscious to us, as scholars in a discipline, we have cognitive biases and assumptions about what is valuable research? What are rigorous methods? What kinds of theories do we think are appropriate to use for certain problems? And part of interdisciplinarity is being able to really critically reflect on that and step back from it and say, hold on, those are assumptions or biases that I might feel about my discipline, but is there something more? Is there another perspective that I might be able to draw on? And then seeing the limitations and benefits of those different perspectives, right? Seeing where the gaps are, seeing where the blind spots are between different subjects and fields, and then trying to fill those gaps in some way. So stage two is taking perspective. So if we take the example of a concept like efficiency, yeah? Economists talk about efficiency, they talk about money out, money in. That's the core, that's the crux of sort of economic efficiency. Biologists talk about efficiency, they're usually talking about energy of some kind, right? Energy out, energy in. Political scientists, when they talk about efficiency, they're talking about influence exerted and political capital expended, right? That's a political understanding of efficiency. But actually, in order to address a problem like, for example, climate change or energy crises, we need all three of these understandings, right? And we actually need to not uh, have a hierarchy of understanding, right? We, we need to step back from this idea of, well, you know, an economic understanding of efficiency is the, is the most important, quote unquote, right? How do these different perspectives and understandings of efficiency work together? And how do we take different perspectives in order to come to some better understanding about what the solution might be? So stage three then is finding common ground between those different perspectives. So discovering shared bases between these conflicting disciplinary insights, making your assumptions explicit rather than having these implicit assumptions and biases, 
bring those to the forefront, right? Put those at the front of what you're studying and how you understand the world. Try to define problems in neutral terms to start to find a common vocabulary. So this comes to things like avoiding jargon, which you're all trying to do in your own research here, right? When you're presenting your work, when you're discussing your work. But it also comes when we think about how we define the problems we're trying to solve and trying to find a common vocabulary in order for us to define those problems in neutral ways, in ways that are going to enable different disciplines to come in. And then I think we need to really tolerate, and in fact, not just tolerate, embrace, I would say, complexity and ambiguity. So this is tough, because I think, especially when we're student researchers, we kind of want answers, right? We're, we're keen to find answers to things, to find answers that we feel sort of comfortable with, that we feel confident about, in being able to go out and present to the world. But actually, interdisciplinary work asks us to embrace this idea of complexity and ambiguity in what we're trying to do. Doesn't mean that we can't have valuable research insights, absolutely. We can, and we should. But those insights need to be tempered by a sense and an acknowledgement that the problems we face are deeply interconnected and interdependent. And then the fourth and final stage, the hardest stage, I would say, is about integrating perspectives. So this is where we're actually generating new understandings of the issues of phenomena that we're looking at. We're integrating insights from these different perspectives. And I chose a sort of friendship bracelet here because I do think that this is actually a really creative process. Right? This is a process of moving outside what we might consider sort of traditional research methods. This is a process of thinking about, really creatively thinking about what different disciplines have to offer and how we can engage with them productively to come up with some new understanding of something that we're interested in finding out about. Yeah? So see, solving, we can solve problems or we can guide research using these new understandings. And I think, crucially, having confidence and intellectual courage. It's out-of-the-box thinking. You might feel like a bit, a bit of a fish out of water when you're doing interdisciplinary work, because it's not so ne neatly categorized. And if any of you have done interdisciplinary work so far in your sort of academic journeys, you've probably noticed this, right? It's hard to categorize. It's hard to describe sometimes. It's hard to fit it in with something that's happening maybe in your university or in your degree. And some courses will allow more space for this than others. But I think try to seek out opportunities like this, right? Like BCUR, Com conferences or publications or journals or symposia where you're able to go along and hear these new perspectives and start to think about how we do this work of integrating their insights. So moving beyond boundaries to become interdisciplinary is something that is not always easy, I would say. I like this cartoon uh, because it asks us to think about, well, what's the weirdest thing you could do to be interdisciplinary, right? So this is an interdisciplinary program where physics students try to hit psychology students with pendulums. Promising, says one person, right? So it's not always easy, and it's about more than just add another discipline and stir. So, this, this cartoon, interdisciplinary studies, chemistry for geologists, math for archaeologists, right? It's about more than that. So that add and stir approach, while it certainly would expose you to new ideas and perspectives, it's not doing interdisciplinary work itself, right? It's going beyond that. So what next? What can you take away from today and actually go and implement? Well, first of all, disciplines aren't going anywhere yet. We know that disciplines and disciplinary knowledge is still really important. You all still go to university to study a field and become an expert in that field. So I'm not here to argue to say disciplines are dead, although there are people out there saying that. I think that the power that interdisciplinarity brings and becoming interdisciplinary brings is that you can put forward arguments that are greater than the sum of their parts put forward arguments that are holistically drawing on a wide range of knowledge that when put together in that particular formulation are greater than the sum of their individual contributions. And to me, that is the, the most valuable part of taking an interdisciplinary approach. And it will look different in different fields and it will look different for, for all of you as you 
if you're interested in taking this kind of forward and moving into interdisciplinary research space. And looking ahead, I think the last message that I would say is just to be intellectually curious, right? Rather than to shut ourselves off to new ideas and new perspectives because we have enrolled in a certain degree program, I think we should be embracing those questions of the unfamiliar, the new, the unknown, what might feel a little bit scary to us theoretically or methodologically, right? And trying to be intellectually curious and be intellectually brave in doing that interdisciplinary work. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. A big, big thank you to Gillian for pushing us to think beyond our boundaries and, and, and at the very first stage, seeing our disciplines differently through working, through the possibility of working in interdisciplinary spaces and also those practical ideas of how to become interdisciplinary, remembering what Gillian said right at the outset from the definition, that this is a process, there's no end point to it. And, I, and I'm just sitting here looking out at all of you, most, not all, but quite a few of you are just at the beginning stages of your journey, you're doing undergraduate degrees and then who knows where you'll go next, who knows what interdisciplinary boundaries you will inevitably cross, whether that's in your academic research or in your professional lives. So I think Gillian's given us some really fantastic insights about how to be bold and creative in thinking in, in interdisciplinary ways. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. I think I'm gonna abuse the timetable a little bit to create some space okay. for questions. Um, we've got a couple of stewards who are gonna hand over mics. Can you put your hand out? And I'll try and take three questions to speed things up and then Gillian can choose which one she wants to answer. <laughs> okay. Who wants Hello, um, my name is Malika and I'm from the Uni of Leeds. I actually did summer school at Carlton University a couple of years ago, so it's really cool that you went there. Um, my question is that as academic researchers, um, it's sort of a glorified end goal to want to be an expert in your field. Um, but as, as we're still students, how would you sort of um, advise us to navigate the thin line between wanting to, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, but between wanting to be an expert at what you do and what you're researching versus encouraging other ideas and disciplines that you may perhaps never be able to truly expertise in. Thank you. And we'll take that question at the back, right in the back row. Somebody had their hands up. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, that was super interesting. I was just wondering, with transdisciplinary research, um, would this potentially suffer from bias from other like strict, you know, single discipline researchers? And if so, what could you potentially do to alleviate this bias and make it more valid? Great, thank you. So we'll take, we'll, oh, actually I've just seen another question here, right in the middle, one with the white hijab. Give Gillian some thinking time. Mm, yeah, <laughs> um, hello, um, I'm Naramie and I'm from Zayed University from the UAE and we actually have a whole um, college of interdisciplinary studies which is really cool and I and as you're doing your presentation it really resonated with me. So you mentioned in your presentation that uh, we should embrace ambiguity. So how do you think we could do that in the most efficient way, especially when, you know, you, like you feel like the, the dots are connecting, but not really sort of thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for three really excellent questions. And I think questions that connect um, in interesting ways as well. Um, I'll take them in order, I think. So I think the navigating the fine line between being a disciplinary expert and being able to draw on sort of interdisciplinary work. I think people are still struggling with this, right? I think I'm still struggling with this. And I'm, you know, uh, sort of, I've been out of my PhD now for about eight years. But I think one of the ways that we can do this is by thinking about what expertise we are bringing in to interdisciplinary conversations. So when you are thinking about your, your subject and your field and, and going further in that field, I think absolutely embrace, you know, becoming an expert, deep diving into the questions that interest you. But I think always having in our minds, being able to communicate that 
in ways that are going to be productive and meaningful for people outside of your field. Right? I think there's a real danger still, even when interdisciplinary work is being embraced more than, say, it was 50, 100 years ago, I think there's still a danger of these echo chambers right, at, at disciplinary levels. And so we see debates really sort of you know, nuanced or niche debates between scholars in a particular field. And I think we sort of have to step back and ask ourselves, well, what is the value of those kinds of debates? Do we want to spend our careers as researchers engaging in really, you know, esoteric arguments with other people in our field? For some people, the answer is a resounding yes, right? They want to do that. But for other people, I think we want, and, as, and I think if you are interested in interdisciplinarity, you probably fall into this camp. You want to spend more time engaging with other disciplines while still having your disciplinary sort of hat on. Right? So you go out into the world with that hat on, and you have lots to say as an expert in that field, but you're able to collaborate, and you're able to sort of you know, co-publish, for example. You're able to attend multi- and interdisciplinary conferences. If you're able to draw on sort of challenges or problems in the way that you address research questions, rather than saying, well, what are the research questions my discipline wants me to look at? I think that will go a long way to sort of helping you navigate that, that line. But it's tough. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I've got an answer. <laughs> I think I'm still struggling. But yeah, I think that would be my um, response. In thinking about transdisciplinary research and that question of whether transdisciplinary research suffers from bias, um, I think it suffers from questions of validity and rigor a lot, right? So we see transdisciplinary scholarship often struggles to get published, uh, struggles to get sort of wide engagement or meaning in terms of the ways in which other scholars look at it and talk about it, respond to it. And so I think the, the bias might come from other scholars' implicit or explicit assumptions about their disciplines, right? And superiority of certain methodological approaches or theoretical approaches over others. So I would say that transdisciplinary research has an even harder time in terms of it, how it sells itself and how transdisciplinary scholarship um, gets sort of traction because it doesn't hang on a, a sort of variety of disciplinary perspectives. Um, I think I don't have an easy answer for how you deal with that question. I think as interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches do become more popular, we, we see them becoming more popular. More universities are, have you know, interdisciplinary studies centers or institutes. We saw the first new university in London for what, over 50 years established a couple of years ago, the London Interdisciplinary School. Right? They don't have disciplines. They don't have de academic departments. And that's a really big shift for the academy. And so I think as these things continue to move in that direction, we might see more appreciation for transdisciplinary research. And then on the question of ambiguity, yeah, how do we deal with ambiguity? I think that's, I mean, that's a big question. That's a question that social scientists, I think, especially are interested in. I think one of the ways that we can do that is to think about the world in systems, right? So I, I'm a big advocate of systems thinking or sort of design thinking in how we understand the way that the world works. And so systems thinking involves a lot of interconnections. And what we're actually interested in are the spaces where different parts of a system are connecting. So we're interested in things like feedback loops, right? Where do we see sort of runaway feedback loops ha happening that are amplifying problems in the world, for example? That doesn't mean that we can't come up with potential solutions or ways to address those problems, but it does mean that we have to deal with questions of ambiguity in the sense of we have a really complex system, and every time there's a change in any part of the system, that will lead to changes, knock-on effects in other parts of the system. And I think using frameworks and methodologies that allow us to be OK with that right, and to deal with that ambiguity is one way to sort of navigate the challenge of that in sort of a research space. Yeah. Thank you. So we maybe we can take two more questions, and then we'll have to bring this session to a close. So there's somebody in the middle there who's got a question. Is there one more question? I know that people some people are going to get ready for the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the uh, presentation. It was really lovely. Uh, someone who uh, does um, interdisciplinary work within uh, the University of Warwick, uh, so with liberal arts, 
One thing that I noticed that you said is that you are really passionate about inclusive pedagogies. Um, and I come from a very similar standpoint with that. Um, I like to think of transdisciplinary as something that really incorporates inclusive pedagogies. So um, for example, pedagogy of the oppressed, which I look at mainly. Um, and I was wondering whether you think it's possible to kind of incorporate these inclusive pedagogies into interdisciplinary work rather than just transdisciplinary? Or is it something which we still have to work towards to really move into the transdisciplinary like sphere, if that makes sense? It does make sense, yeah, thank you. I think that's such an interesting question. And thinking about the relationship between pedagogies and sort of how we approach disciplines, I think is such an, uh, a sort of fascinating area. Because if we think about the ways in which we're taught, right, and the assumptions that are built on the methods and approaches for teaching and learning in certain disciplines, we can understand where inclusive pedagogies might have a really, really important role to play. So I actually have argued that inclusive pedagogies are something that can more easily be embraced in interdisciplinary spaces, right? And I would include sort of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary spaces in that. Because I think without the sort of rigid boundaries of a discipline to sort of frame how people are teaching, right? If we think about teaching the canon and what that means in a disciplinary sense, interdisciplinary spaces actually enable more students to engage meaningfully with the material that they're learning because they don't necessarily feel as boxed in, right? By particular disciplinary angles, lenses, methods, etc. And so in LSE 100 here at LSE, that's what we try to sort of design the entire course around. Right? How do you enable students to come into a classroom and feel like they can reflect both on their disciplinary knowledge and expertise, but also their lived experience in the world when they're thinking about the things that they're teaching or that, we're, that they're learning in an LSE 100 classroom? So I think absolutely, right? We can use and we should be embracing in inclusive pedagogies in interdisciplinary spaces. And I think it's, it's a, the space that is sort of most ripe for those kinds of pedagogical approaches. Yeah. Thank you, Gillian, for a brilliant and inspiring talk. And thank you all for being so engaged and for your excellent questions. Let's um, give a final round of applause to Gillian.